Hello, this is Dr. Abraham Weisfeld here. For here and now, um, I have a document that I want to present to you. It's um, political theory. So if you don't like political theory, get lost, you know, that type of thing, because this is what it's all about. So it's posted on the uh, academia.edu site of mine called Third Worldism and Permanent Revolution, <clears throat> written today and thought of this morning, actually, after getting stoned. So here it is, the results. It occurs to me that on this day of reflection, that the theory of third worldism is flawed in its pessimistic conclusions regarding the first world. The viability of socialist revolution in the first world countries as being less than likely is made prematurely due to its limitations of the Marxist empirical paradigm of the class criticism in exclusion of the class context and national culture or gender-based ideologies and identities. Class alone as a dynamic has failed due to the relative balance of power, but more essentially due to the division imposed of national chauvinism. Such chauvinism is rampant amongst the working classes due to the capitalist value criterion of self-interest. Collective self-interest is no solution. In any case, national collectives may very well be fascist. The working class political culture is no match for the national culture instilled from birth. Previously, Marxism has accepted the political framework as being the nation state and so defined the nation, as in Hegelianism. In actuality, there is civil society. Its birth is named a revolution, social revolutions. As such, the dynamic and the program of revolution are embellished to include the struggle of social formations, in addition to or on top of this class struggle. The combination of the two dimensions of social struggles based in the class struggle provides for an elaboration of this historic theory of permanent revolution against capitalism and its state. The Chinese Revolution of 1949 is a, the model of the dynamic of this combined revolutionary process as contrasted with the failed Chinese Revolution of 1936-37. The contrast between the two is the political strategy that are associated with each. While the 1949 revolution was based on the peasantry as a revolutionary reservoir of national liberation, the 1936-37 revolution was a class collaborationist effort with the national bourgeoisie or compradors in a national popular front that merely resulted in a civil war by the Kuomintang against the Communist Party cadre who were massacred. So much for the popular front strategy. This form of populism was promoted by the theory of primary and secondary contradictions, which gave priority, priority to the one over the other, that being the primacy of the national liberation struggle in place of the class struggle. With national liberation, it is postulated the class revolution then takes hold and transforms the national revolution into a class revolution. This is the stages methodology that formally places one contradiction over another as if there were a hierarchy of struggles when actually they are merged and take place at the same time. The relevance of the permanent revolution for the first world takes form in the united front of the various nationalities, which comprise the fourth world, inside the first world, and who seek their national cultural autonomy. The combined nature of this form of national liberation insists that the working class elements of each nationality and other social formation formations become the vanguard of a social revolution. I'll read that again. The combined nature of this form of national liberation insists that the working class elements of each such nationality and other social formations become the vanguard of a social revolution. 
This is the natural dynamic of the class struggle in the nationalities, the gender-based communities, and the generational revolts. The combined character of each struggle provides for a common solution in the eradication of capitalism, so forming the basis for the United Front, apart from the liberal bourgeois reformist forces seeking to monopolize the leadership of any struggle at all. Such a revolutionary united front achieves its preponderance of balance of power through the, force, through the forces of each struggle based in the working class, which holds the reins of the economy and the state. Considering the revolutionary potential of the combined nature of all struggles concerned with the prospect for revolutionary social change in the first world becomes as such clearer and visible. Corresponding to the political heter heterogeneity of the United Front movements, it is not possible to fashion a political organization based on the nation state model and class alone. Such a political party is doomed uh, from the first instance, since it ignores the actual dynamics to be found in the social formations that are alienated from the prevailing social norms imposed by the bourgeois state. This is what has been named demarchism as in the rule of the people or civil society. This methodology is to be distinguished from populism, which is a liberal scheme to gather greater forces around the bourgeois middle classes to make up for the lack of its own intrinsic power to contest the bourgeoisie and the state, and the state power. To conclude, it is imperative that the defeatist notions inherent to the theory of third worldism be revised to realize the revolutionary dynamic available in the first world Class struggle is only the beginning of the various social formations moving forward to their eventual liberation. Okay. That's the critique, but simply, actually, you know, if you want to elaborate, you know, you have to get into much more, you know, you have to get into, you know, the history, um, historiography of, of the nation, the nation state, you know, where the nation state comes from, what the nation is, was, and has always been and, and will be, you know, this is all very elaborate, you know, like, and it, and it is elaborated in my doctoral thesis, you know, of more than 700 pages, I think 753 pages. So you can see this is only a beginning. This is a simple sort of a, you know, presentation, you know, and if you find it, you know, complex, then read it again and go to the academia.edu site and go for the Third Worldism and Permanent Revolution article there. It's not even a paper. It's just, you know, a little thing here, you know, that should be understood readily. Next, war in Gaza. Okay. I'm continuing the uh, Jewish Bund uh, vigil at the uh, Jewish community campus here in Montreal. And it is taking place on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of every week until there's a ceasefire. And it has uh, been ongoing since two weeks now. And previous to that, it had been taking place every Sunday since the beginning of this war. Not since the beginning of the war, you know, because the first, you know, five demonstrations, six demonstrations that I went to were the... Uh, Palestinian demonstrations. And uh, now I have a telephone call that I should answer. So bye for now. I'm not ready to spend so much money on a project 
in a city that I don't even live in. And I mentioned this previously, so I don't want to speak any further about it. Okay. Yes, we're still in Florida. Good. Okay, so now I can elaborate. The pressure is being put on the Zionist war cabinet of Netanyahu, King Bibi, by everyone now, even including the United States, you know, but he's still intent upon continuing. And the United States is content to let him continue despite its, you know, vocal protestations, which are merely opportunistic. So, today, the latest news is that, you know, they're so uh, uh, gung-ho and panicky that they even killed three of their own Israeli hostages who were probably soldiers who were carrying a white flag, you know, and had, had stripped the torso. So they weren't obviously carrying any, you know, like body bombs. And yet they were killed in any case. And, you know, the Israelis are becoming aware of this kind of insanity. And perhaps this will be a turning point in this uh, war. But uh, don't count on it, you know, because the war cabinet, you know, has no serious opposition inside the Knesset, other than the Palestinian parties, which are ignored and shout it down. So what is to be here is uh, the war continues. Hamas is fighting effectively against the uh, Zionist military, but the uh, Zionist state, you know, like is waging a war, not just on Hamas, they're also waging a war on the Palestinian people. And so they're bombing the civilians on the surface while Hamas is protected, you know, underground in tunnels, even, you know, with the tunnels being flooded, you know, by salt water. How long can they keep that up? You know, the salt water is going to just drain into the sand in any case. So, you know, big deal. <laughs> I saw a video, you know, from a Zionist military showing how they had discovered, you know, a gun in a plastic bag, you know, underneath a um, incubator uh, a, a surface. <laughs> As if this were, you know, like equivalent to a nuclear bomb or something like that, you know, that, <laughs> you know, like one gun, you know, not even a rifle. <laughs> oh, it's so pathetic and sad. And, you know, this is what motivates me, you know, go back to the Jewish community campus, you know, to tell every single person who goes in there, you know, that this is a war not in our name that Palestinian lives matter too, that uh, Canada has voted for a ceasefire and uh, we should too. So, you know, like these are unde undeniable statements, you know, that they have no response to, except for, you know, fuck you or something like that. And then I just say, well, that doesn't seem very logical to me, you know. And then they, this one, you know, like Mizrahi guy, you know, well-dressed, you know, rich, obviously comes up to me, you know, and pretends, you know, that he's going to be, you know, like aggressive. And I just stand up to him and take a step forward in his face. He backs down immediately. And then after a while, you know, like he's trying to play chummy and ask me if I speak French. And so we exchange some French and then he's off, you know, without considering anything. Yeah. I think he's one of the people, you know, like who I said, you know, like if all the horror atrocities, you know, mentioned by the Israeli government, you know, are valid, you know, and they're to be taken as a reason for genocide. You know, where's the proof? You know, like I give him my card with my email address, say, okay, send me the proof. I want to know the truth. You know, like show me the proof. I never received any proof from a number of people that I had gave my card to. And yet they probably haven't even changed their minds. So it's going to take, you know, something of a class struggle here in the Jewish community, you know, to change things around, you know, because the uh, Jewish national bourgeoisie controlling the um, combined Jewish appeal, you know, buys off, you know, and controls every other Jewish organization in the community, in the civil society here, because it controls its funding. 
that's it that's all you know that's all there is to it you know and everybody has to fall into line you know if they want to keep their salary that's how it is so uh i'm missing uh steve and ahmad who are really occupied so next week you know we'll come back with you and they explain what's going on in depth and without lies so here we are see you next time